Welcome to Matchback Systems Podcast. I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Boo Blue Saka Vigold. Boo Blue joins us from the world of academia, talking to us from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, where she's a faculty member of the Logistics Management Department. Welcome and thanks very much for taking the time to talk with us, Boo Blue. Thank you for having me. So, um, you're working at a prestigious STEM university in Switzerland, but I know you have commercial experience. How did you get into supply chain academia? Well, I've in in a way I've been involved in in supply chain right from the beginning. Um, yes, I'm I've been at um, the ETH, which is what it's called here in Zurich, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, for about 11 years now. Um, prior to that, I worked in industry um, in Germany and uh, yeah, in Germany for 20 years. And before that, I studied operations research at um, at a university um, that actually resembles uh, the ETH. So um, I'm trained as an engineer, and I, I, I did mathematical modeling of, of industrial networks as an undergraduate. And so I was looking at these questions um, in abstract uh, as a student. And um, at the time, um, as a mathematician, it's, it's fascinating to see how networks play out and all of the non, non-intuitive effects that they have. Um, but I uh, had to admit that I thought there must be more than the paper and the math to all this. My professors used to complain that managers were so stupid, they just weren't willing um, to read their papers yeah. and uh, um, and understand their answers, um, and that, that, that CEOs and managers wanted like a, um, a one or two page uh, executive summary and not uh, three, three pounds of, of printout paper with the model on it. And uh, I just recall thinking back then, as smart as all this this uh, science is, and it's so blinding and, and impressive, and all these smart people have answers, um, if the answers don't really get out and support the decisions of, of managers out there, I really wonder what the purpose of it is, um, uh-huh. other than entertaining other professors. And so yeah. I was eager to get into industry. Um, I left as a trained engineer. Um, I moved to Europe. And um, that was an, that was uh, a serendipitous move in the sense that I was I moved from a place that didn't have too many factories and, and a huge and a different kind of industrial base in, in North America. And I moved to a place that had a whole lot of factories and a whole lot of people with their hands dirty in making things. And so. Um, I spent the next 20 years um, seeing, uh, you know, what what really happens um, in manufacturing and uh, the the supply chain around it, and um, how tricky it is to make decisions, how stressful it is, um, you know, how little information you have, how little influence you have on other people on the system. Uh, I saw the complexity and the reality of it all. Um, after 20 years uh, in Germany, in in uh, yeah, in that industrial heartland, I moved to Switzerland, and um, was looking for a change in career, and um, uh, thought uh, it would be interesting to work with the universities um, that we had worked with uh, at the com- at the. I was working for a very large um, company called HP Hewlett Packard. We we made PCs, and and other um, computer products. Um, in my last few years over there, not only worked with the, the server factory in southern Germany and um, and other sites, but we worked closely with universities um, in our supply chain unit to see what what sort of um, ideas they had and uh, and bring them into the the company and, and diffuse them as process innovation. So that was actually a very um, interesting group that we had. Um, Uh, in the company. And I saw, hey, you know, um, it's very very important to bring in new ideas and and good processes into um, into uh, into the industrial context and that universities are a source of this. And so I had some experience in transferring it back and forth, uh, meaning giving the universities our data and bringing in um, their research findings to us and seeing if you know how we couldn't deploy them in our own in our own organization Um, so when i got here i i I thought okay i can either continue um 
you know, um, sort of being practical and, and being on, on the, the shop floor. Um, or I could uh, I could talk to the universities and there was, a, the, the chair of logistics management here at ETH was just opening up. And uh, I proposed it. I said, hey, you know, could you use someone who does that kind of technology transfer, who's the bridge between theory and practice? And strangely enough, at the beginning, they said, no, we don't need that. We're a research university. We need researchers. Why don't you research for us? And I said, you know, um, you have, there are a lot of very good people doing research, but I think this bridging is, is something that the world needs. I'm so convinced of that. Um, after 11 years, a very, very interesting uh, work here at the university. I'm not a researcher, but I do work with, with the firms in the area, there are a whole lot of them, to see um, you know, what we can do for them, um, how we can bring our ideas and the research findings um, into practice, and then um, bringing their data and also their process innovations here so that we can formalize them and publish them. Okay, so how how do you shape and mesh together the theory and the practice of supply chain management? That is a task uh, for a lifetime. <laughs> and so um, if you're asking for a quick answer, I don't think I'll be able to give it to you. I guess I'd start by saying that these worlds are actually pretty incompatible considering um, how dependent they are on each other. At least they should be dependent on each other. Um, uh, they, uh, as you'll know, if you've ever re read an academic paper, which can easily go 60, 70 pages um, and have long, uh, like a lot of uh, very, very technical content, you can spend a lot of time trying to sort of understand what the models mean and, and follow the math. Um, uh, academic papers are, are usually written for other academics and to impress uh, others, and um, the barriers of, of entry are really the rigor. Um, that the uh, research community uh, imposes on itself. So professors want things to be really clear, really well-defined, uh, properly solved according to scientific um, standards, and um, basically referring to all of the you know all of the knowledge that's ever been established in that area before that. Uh, now, if you if you know what a manager does, um, first of all, the problems are not clearly defined. Um, there's often not even, um, you know, they might be completely new. Um, so if a manager were to come to you and say, okay, what do I do? What sort of distribution system should I create in the face of Brexit? Or what does this tariff mean for China? Or if, you know, um, 20 years ago, nobody was even thinking about global supply chains in the way we do today. It's like a you know, the, the world is constantly changing. So the practice um, is going much, much faster, the practical world, those who are making decisions every day. The academic world wor uh, moves very, very slowly um, because it's so rigorous, because it's so um, diligent in its detail. And so in a way, they're totally incompatible. On the other hand, they have so much to give uh, to each other. Mm -hmm. And... Um, they are both extremely rich, and so it's important to create dialogues. Uh, it's more, I mean, what every university will do at some level is um, <clears throat> there are conferences, there are events, um, uh, managers are, are, are um, almost all the managers I know are committed to educating themselves. They go back uh, to school, they get their master's, there are a lot of executive programs out there. These are very good ways for people to come up to date on what's happening. Um, there are a lot of good uh, journals that you can read that aren't um, as scholarly as some of the really tough ones, um, which which um, provide in, in a narrative form, meaning in a storytelling form, sort of the, the latest really good ideas, like what does blockchain mean? Uh -huh. um, or, um, you know, um, uh, how do we, how do we, yeah, the, the newest ideas that are coming out um, of research and what um, um, I think, uh, um, I guess the, the universities really need to do um, is, uh, you know, create programs, which is what we're committed to do, um, you know, in which um, they can support, they can um, provide other services to industry. Um, not necessarily in, in a consulting form because that exists and consultants are not something we want to, uh, we want to and we can. Um, 
compete with, but uh, really find new ways and new forms to bring the knowledge um, uh, to the people who who, will put, who really need it. Yeah. And um, you know, they're more than they shouldn't. We shouldn't be looking at at managers as lab rats. You know, we study you, but we don't want to talk to you. Um, you know, there really has to be um, there really has to be some way that we can. Um, transfer this technology and there are new research forms that are coming out like design science and in general the whole idea of design thinking is very much um, which has come out of uh, the Stanford University is uh, very much a, a way of bringing academic thinking and um, industrial practice together. Right now um You've done a lot of talking about in the real world. You've done a lot of teaching and research in the area of humanitarian logistics. Can you oh, tell yeah. us about your experience in that sector? How, how does a humanitarian logistics operation work? Oh, where to even begin? Actually, let me, if I go back two steps to your previous question, humanitarian logistics was actually one of um, the ways in which um, practice and theory uh, came together at our institute here in Zurich in the sense that uh, Switzerland is full of humanitarian organizations. The, um, the Red Cross is here. Gen the whole Geneva area is full of them. So we have a cluster of humanitarian um, headquarters here. So in the most peaceful and, and, and richest part of the world, you know, all these organizations are organizing their work um, in the war zones and the crisis zones all over the world. And they came to us and they said, hey, you know, I don't know if you know this. It's a, it's a little known fact, but it's shocking. But 80 percent of um, the money that goes into a humanitarian project is spent by logistics. Amazing. OK. 80 that's a full 80 percent mm -hmm. and if you think about it if you think about the waste levels of normal um, operations in any commercial company whether it's gm or whether it's hp or whether it's whatever um, you know without very robust supply chain management um, you can easily have 40 to 50 percent waste at any time if you measure it if, if systems get out of whack and they're not optimized so if you do the math and you say 80 percent of the money in um, in a humanitarian uh, mission is logistics, and if half of that is lost uh, is is lost to waste, um, you are seeing um, huge uh, what should I say huge huge opportunities to save lives are, are are going out the window with that kind of waste. So if we were able to reduce the waste from 50 to 20 or even 10 percent, which which is sometimes what we can do in commercial um, situations that translates directly into lives saved and so the moral imperative was there we um, we had the close uh, you know we uh, these organizations were close by they came to us and they said okay 80 percent is logistics and that means and it really comes from the procurement function so people are are buying are buying goods they're buying drugs they're buying um, vaccines they're buying tents they're buying logistics services the transport into a war zone is immensely expensive the the markets are destroyed there are this like if you go to Syria there is no um, trucking company that you can yeah, easily no hire to move something if you go to um, uh, yeah South Sudan I mean good luck in finding a port that to, to even bring it close by and so on so these these challenges are immense um, so what are their needs? They came to us and they said, hey, you guys know, you, you know, you have an MBA program in supply chain management and you're teaching people on how to solve these problems. We need to get our stuff there. We need to get it in time. So if you ever think of, um, if you think of logistics and supply chain as the function of trying to improve your service, meaning your availability, um, you know, at the lowest cost, I mean, they're up against the worst possible challenges. So, um, uh, you know, they have to get it right away. Every de every second, every minute delay means a live loss or, you know, uh, some some sort of um, terrible um, consequence for real human beings who are waiting and in need. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the urgency is there. Um, they don't have a lot of resources. They don't have um, a proper infrastructure. They can't decide on a rational basis where they're going to put things. They have to live with what's there. And they don't have a lot of trained people. If you go into these organizations, you'll see um, 
a lot of social scientists. You'll see a lot of well-meaning people like um, pastors and teachers and English teachers. And like there's, yeah. um, you don't see a lot of operations research um, or, or um, trained logisticians. Like that sort of science is, is not um, usually part of their talent uh, uh, recruitment. Um, like I said, there's a lot of well-meaning action. Um, but as you know, this is a profession. Logistics and supply chain has become a profession in the last 20 years, and, and good in, intentions um, are not enough. And so uh, what we did is that uh, here at the university, we said, okay, we have to develop trainings that are um, not overly academic. We, if you start and give them like a 30-page uh, case study um, to uh, people who have barely, um, you know, um, national staff have often not finished school. Right. So you, you're facing a lot of literacy and numeracy challenges out there. So um, we as professors and as, as lecturers here at uh, Technical University, we really have to change our understanding of the audience. We have to develop new instructional design. We have to engage with them and talk to them. And that's where action learning comes in, um, a lot less, less, lot less book knowledge, um, humanitarian logisticians, do not have time to look up in the book how it works. Right. Um, you know what? So what we do is that we help them um, together with uh, like in in groups. We I think it's very important you go out to the field as much as possible. That you um, you uh, understand what they're trying to do. Now, obviously, Doctors Without Borders um, that sets up a, a field hospital in a few days in in Cox Bazar in Bangladesh is doing a completely different uh, type of logistics than, um, say, World Food Program that is bringing food um, supplies to a famine um, in Africa. And so uh, the requirements are very different. Um, the, uh, the capabilities are very different. You'll see also that Doctors Without Borders does work with a lot of engineers and, and intellectual people where you can explain complicated t things to them and they will get it and they will implement um, um, at least the technical solutions. But you always faced with the group-based action. Like how do you get a group of people um, in an organization uh, to work together so that the system achieves its objectives. Um, that challenge remains. And um, so we've, we've developed methods to address that. Right, so part, part of your curriculum for um, teaching humanitarian workers would be communication. And how much of a part does technology play in humanitarian logistics? Um, you'd be surprised how much technological uh, advancement they have. I've been I've been very impressed. Um, and technology um, doesn't solve their problems. I mean, we know that from the commercial space. Uh, installing SAP does not solve any company's problems. It often aggravates them. So you still have to like train people in their process. You still have to get, um, like I said, these heterogeneous groups, these cross-functional teams to work together. Um, they tend to work at cross purposes. So first they have to see their own system and they have to see how their process works and they have to make sure the information flows and they have to make sure the feedback loops are correct. And with that, we, we've uh, developed like a, a, a customized version, a very specific version of the beer game, which we find one of the most powerful tools um, ever. Um, so like getting people to sim simulate to actually, um, um, yeah, a game, it, it sounds, uh, Sounds, um, you know, should I say facetious? It's, it, was, it wasn't funny. Nobody laughed. And uh, there were no jokes about beer. We actually call it the high energy biscuit game, which is um, the food product that the World Food Program distributes um, to in, in, uh, in uh, uh, crisis regions. And so we, we give them, um, we, we put them in a situation where in, in, a, um, in a classroom environment, a safe classroom environment, they can actually test out certain processes and, and uh, play out the game. And it is, it is a simulation of operations out there. And, and, and through these types of, of instruct, instructional design, we've, we've made big headway 
in training people and they don't have to have a mathematical background and they don't have to have a degree and they don't even uh, have to read and write in every single case. We were amazed. Um, you know, if we just get people talking to each other and, and uh, graphing out what they were doing, we were amazed at how much they did understand the importance um, of basic logistics principles. Right. Now, to get back to your question about technology, like we don't, um, we, you know, we, um, if, if you go into um, humanitarian operation in the field, you'll see um, there's like technology has been a big um, boost for their productivity and, and making their lives easier. Um, you'll see uh, there are um, one of the challenges that any organization has is just trying to assess the need. How many people, you know, just like any company needs to do some planning and some forecasting, like how do you forecast a disaster? Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you can imagine the challenge. You really don't, like, you don't know what's happening and it comes per se as a surprise. Yeah. So it's like a sudden onset supply chain that you have to basically set up uh, overnight. And you need to know, well, you know, I have lead times from my suppliers and you need to know um, how much to order of whatever. And uh, quality differences can kill you, can actually destroy the whole purpose of what you're doing. And, and you know, a misspend can't be retrieved. So, you know, if you are in a Muslim area and you've bought food that has pork products, you know, you have to be very, very careful about matching supply and demand. But technology helps in the sense that, um, you know, the, the, these organizations that are extremely resourceful, they're extremely good at improvising good solutions. They've, they're using smartphones to keep uh, information flowing, to, to get um, communication in, in regions where infrastructure is destroyed. Um, and there are uh, now mapping uh, apps that have, developed, that have been developed. I've seen it at, at uh, Doctors Without Borders at MSF and where they're constantly using GPS data to actually share with one another, you know, this, the growing size of, say, a refugee camp. And the Cox Bazaar, um, it's, it's very, very hard to even know how big it is, how many people are coming. People are coming every day. Um, and, uh, and so, like, the location of your activities will depend on the, de the demand and sort of the perimeter of that zone. And so they've got technology that helps them track that and update it very well. And the updating is very, very tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then for the distribution of goods, where I'm seeing a lot of um, technology that, that um, you know, for registering beneficiaries, which is what the, the needy people are called there. So if a benefit, you know, in, in a refugee camp or in a hospital or, or um, in any um, facility they set up, they, they need to know who came, who is this, have they been here before. Um, they need to also keep statistics to report back to donors. Um, they're using sort of um, sort of eye recognition technology. I think it's, it's called Retina. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, and that's that's in use to um, register um, beneficiaries as they come to track um, the the distribution that's happened. To also distribute, there's um, there's strategies now saying, okay, instead of distributing food to them, we are going to have cash programs where they receive money, and then um, they can you know, the choice is restored to these people. It gives them the dignity that, that any of us want, um, that they can then decide um, how to, um, how to you know, uh, care for themselves. And so there's cash distribution instead of goods. And one of the ways that you can manage that um, is with technology. And um, these things are being rolled out right now in the field. And, and I'm very, very impressed because it gives us whole new ways to solve the problem and to match supply with demand. Right, that's great. Um, now, to talk, I mean, uh, it's just such a huge topic. I'd love to talk to you for like two days about it. Um, the cat, cat, cat. Sure is. It's <laughs> huge. It's, it's and we're getting a bit away from the commercial. Um, that's fine. Commercial that's why we're talking it. to you, Bibli, so we can get a different perspective on on uh, supply chain management. So. Coming back to your academic life and talking of technology, where does sure. tech and innovation fit into your programs? How important has technology become in the in the curricula? In our curriculum, um, actually, you'd be surprised. Well, 
if you go into uh, organizations, and uh, and as I was telling you before, as we were chatting, you know, a lot of our understanding of the world is is through the media, and um, I'm always a little appalled at how much supply chain management is is reduced to a techn technology solution. And maybe it's our own fault um, that we say, okay, you know, it's all about IT, so we're all a bunch of um, you know, we think that if we just install this software, there, there's a software that will tell us how much to forecast, or there's a software that will, um, you know, that will run our, our menu, you know, that will do our, our manufacturing um, uh, for us. There's a software that will, um, that will manage our suppliers and so on and so forth, that will decide where to send what, and that if we just had all the data in one transparent system, uh, the computer would make it happen, and with with uh, big data and artificial artificial intelligence, blockchain, and all of these um, buzzwords, um, you know, then technology is the answer. Technology is never the answer. Uh, we are the answer. The process is the answer. The people are the answer. Um, technology without um, the manager is, um, yeah, it's never. Uh, it's never adapted to the business case. Uh, a supply chain is um, also the, the network and the web of relationships that we have. Um, we define the, the question um, and then we look for the right answer. So technology is an enabler. It's not the answer itself. Um, we have to use it intelligently and wisely. And um, so uh, that said, it's it's very powerful. We couldn't do it without it. We need ERP systems like SAP, blockchain. I'm I'm convinced um, will be um, will be very very important in the future if it does um, resolve the issues of uh, if you know if it creates like a way to um, to increase trust and and um, and honesty in in systems um, that will uh, that will uh, be a, a huge help okay. as we go forward. Um, but uh, like I said, I, I think that that what we're teaching at the end of the day um, is strategic. I think this is not just a technical task about moving goods or moving boxes. If we want logistics to be effective and efficient and strategic, meaning um, driving the growth and the competitiveness of our firms and now of our economies, um, we're going to have to look at how information flows. We're going to have to look at um, how our, our operations um, support the strategy of a firm. Do we want high availability or low availability? Um, do we want things to be fast or do we want things to be slow? Um, do we want expensive supply chains or, or, or um, cheap and efficient ones? And um, these are, are strategies that we implement with technology, um, but the technology doesn't, doesn't determine the strategy. There was like a famous Harvard uh, Business Review article that said, you know, um, IT doesn't matter anymore. If we all have the same technological solutions, then we have all the same firms. And so, but there, that of course is not the reality. We have um, firms that perform more, better, and worse. And one of the success factors is, you know, the the way we run our supply chains, the way we use technology um, to make things happen to achieve our objectives. Um, so this is this is what we try to teach, um, you know, in our classes. And um, this is also what we study. We teach one way, meaning we try to pass on what we know. Um, but we continue to learn from the the managers out there who are innovating in this space, and it's amazing. And the use of technology is going to be a huge differentiator in the future. I'm I'm quite convinced of that. And and talking about the future, um, I can't let you go without asking your <laughs> views on the impact of tariffs and the trade tensions, and of course Brexit. Um, it oh must be God. interesting times for you and your students. So much material to uh, to study. So, what what what's your take? What are, what are the lessons from this? Oh my gosh, the world is changing, and you're asking me today <laughs> just before you know, as as we we sort of look into the abyss of of a possible Brexit. Well, um, yeah, uh, huge question. Um, very important. Let's let's go to some of the basics of it here. Um, 
my personal experience and and the theory definitely supports this is, is that you know um free trade and global trade has made the world more um of course more more healthy like our uh, not healthy our well healthy yes uh has has increased our wealth it has been the source of growth um remarkable growth in the past uh, 50 years um and uh supply chains global supply chains have been a huge part of that in the sense that uh, they've made it possible for different developing countries around the world to participate um in uh in in trade at the level that's not just you know selling um agricultural products which have very low productivity and very low profitability but you know a country like China could join Apple's supply chain without inventing the iPhone, meaning this this gave the world a chance to work together, um, to be productive together. Um, that was obviously um, driven by huge waves of outsourcing, so so um, work and was moved around the world because technology made it possible, because political opening made it possible. Uh, when I came to Germany right after my undergraduate uh, degree, after graduating from college as a student, um, that was in 1988, and I'd barely been there a year when the wall fell, the Berlin Wall fell. And as dramatic as that was, what it really signaled was the opening of a huge market in the East. Uh, people wanted to consume things and people who wanted to work. And that opening um, enabled the, um, yeah, uh, bringing up these regions to the same standard of living pretty much that we have over here. I remember what the East looked like in 1988, and uh, I'm just amazed at how uh, global trade has brought them up to the, the standard of Central Europe in many, many cases. Che the Czech Republic is, is defined today um, as a developed country. So you have to imagine that the progress that we've made is amazing. Yeah. And I don't think we should we should, you know, in all of the the um all of the negative press around outsourcing and um the loss of of jobs in one place or out, you know, um exporting jobs to to cheap labor and so on and so forth. This this extremely politically div divisive rhetoric that we see in the press, we we should never forget. Um, this extremely positive development that has been driven by global, uh, global trade and supply chains, um, not just in Eastern Europe, in China. China itself has raised a billion people out of poverty since it opened its market. And so, um, and that's, that's a measured fact. A billion people is a lot if they're not starving anymore. Yeah. And I have respect for that. And I think this, that this type of progress is something we should aim for. But what we're clearly seeing is that, you know, progress is uneven. If China has uh, taken a billion people out of poverty, it means like a lot of people in, in uh, the industrial and industrialized nations um, have had to adjust. They're competing with those people now, and that's something we're not used to. We're used to competing at our national level. Now we're, we're competing with everybody everywhere, um, you know, because technology has made it possible and, and because the world's open now. Um, that means people in the U.S. Uh, in certain regions have lost their jobs. There's been a clear, measurable deindustrialization in the G7 countries. That's simply a fact. Uh, and that happened in 30 years, which is super fast. Um, and as we know, social adjustment is slower than technological and um, supply chain adjustment. Supply chains change, reconfigure quickly, overnight, uh, effectively. But social adjustments are slower. And that's what we're seeing right now with tariffs. Um, that's a political inter intervention that's come out of the backlash. Um, people feel, um, people fear uh, for what will happen with this kind of trade openness. And uh, it's had a lot of very, very unpleasant and very um, um, uh, threatening, I would say, at mm -hmm. some level, um, development in our societies that really benefited and became rich by being open. And um, so we're seeing a movement, some, some of a backlash um, towards being more closed. I just I will give you this much. Uh, there's an OECD CD study that says, you know, we live in a networked world and in, in, in the supply chain, um, 
you know, where, where goods cross borders several times, there's a lot of trade of intermediate products. We're not trading cars anymore. We're trading all of the components of cars back and forth across borders, right? So um, yeah. uh, Boeing is not made in the U.S. Almost every single component that came, that you know, that belongs in that plane came from someplace else. So all of those components have, um, you know, have had to be exported and imported. And uh, with every time it crosses a border, if there's a tariff that has an amplifying effect, there's a multiplying effect. So a 5% tariff um, in a highly fragmented production process will lead to a 25% increase in the price of the final good. So, you know, these old ways of protecting your economy are actually very much, um, you know, don't work anymore mm -hmm. because we used to trade cars made in the U.S. for wine made in France, but that doesn't happen anymore. Um, you know, the cars that are made in the U.S. have glass that was made in France. And so if you start putting tariffs, um, you know, if you, if you start erecting these um these economic walls, actually, you're not doing yourselves any favors because the products that you consume for cheap in your domestic markets are cheap and affordable and avail and accessible to everyone because of that openness. So if you impose a five percent tariff, imagine that the the end you know the the final good will will increase by twenty five percent. And someone calculated that a 20% tariff would increase the same, it would increase to 160%. So I'm seeing like an alarming trend here as a supply chain engineer. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, I don't believe we, you know, all of history has shown us that isolationism and like an autark economy um, is just not competitive. Now you just um, don't want to have. Um, there, there's so many European jokes, right? Don't want to have you want to have your food cooked by the French and not by the British. You want to have your cars built by the Germans and uh, not by the Italians, and so on and so forth. We we make yeah, these, yeah. these 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 sort of racist jokes, but I think it it, it points to the fact that there are, um, you know, we have competitive industries in different places, and if we specialize in trade, we're all better off. Right. Um, so I, I would like, you know, I've, I see the European Union as a peace process um, by becoming dependent on each other economically. You know, the, the original intent was to avoid uh, the war, uh, the, the war to end all wars, the devastation uh, after the Second World War, saying, you know, this can never happen again. So we are not, um, you know, we have to find a way to stop being enemies. Yes. And um, economic dependency is a good way. Mm -hmm. Especially in the end, it made everyone much more, um, you know, wealthy, and uh, really gives everyone a chance to focus on what they do well. Yeah. So that's sort of my you know, my take on it. I, I, I'm hoping that we will we will see quickly. Unfortunately, what will happen is that uh, you know populism uh, makes all the gives a lot of very easy answers, and. Um, you know, what we're dealing with in, in our world systems is extremely complex and it's hard to explain. And believe me, my job is just that, trying to explain complicated things yeah. in a way so everybody gets it. And it's, it's uh, we have a lot of politicians out there, you know, um, who think um, it doesn't matter it, it, if, you know, you don't really need to um, uh, understand it in any more depth. It's all super simple. Uh, right. Our jobs are leaving, so we're just going to put up a wall. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of unintended consequences of this. Yes, and it's actually a complex, a complex subject that's simplified so much. Oh, yeah. The political game. So, you know, we will see what happens, what what will happen in the UK, what will happen to, to the European Union. Um, the European Union, like I said, is is wealthy because um, of of uh, sort of the dismantling of trade barriers, and there's a lot of research um, to this effect. It's one of the things that's very well researched. Uh, it's not not well communicated, so most people don't know it. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think that um, Brussels knows that um, 
there's not going to be a super extra deal for the UK simply because then everybody would want that and uh, the logic would break apart yeah. and we go back to a much less efficient and effective system um, with, with uh, you know, the nation state in Europe has always um, been a very, very dangerous thing. Over yes. Time. Yeah. Oh, very blue. Well, so we've gone into the philosophy of the world here. I'm just a supply chain engineer. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you, Bibler. It's so interesting to get such a different perspective on the industry and what's going on with globalization and the world of humanitarian logistics, which, you know, we're just not familiar with. So thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Well, it was my pleasure. All I can say to, to you and to everybody else out there um, who's working in this sector, meaning logistics and supply chain, um, if you just think of yourselves too humbly that we're just a bunch of nerds out there um, trying to move boxes, it's not true. I think we should recognize the responsibility we have here and the impact that we have on uh, on the world and the potential that we have to do good. And so, you know, if I can just leave that as a last word, um, you know, I hope that all of us would, will stay committed to to making sure that things move and things stay open um, so that, you know, we're, we're all a little bit better off. Thank you so much, Blueberry. That's a lovely way of, of, of ending the podcast. Thank you. All the best to you. Thank you.